Hi and welcome to Programming Percy. Today we will be talking about WebSockets, what they are and how we can use them, and how we can use them in Go to build real-time applications. If we think about it, regular HTTP APIs are dumb, like really dumb. We can fetch data by sending a request to the server. If we keep fresh data on our, say, website, we have to continuously request the same data over and over and over, and this is called polling. And this is like having a kid in the back seat asking, are we there yet? Instead of just having the driver say, we are here now. This is the way we started to develop websites long ago, but it's kind of silly, isn't it? Thankfully, developers have solved this with technologies such as WebSockets, uh, WebRTC, gRPC, HTTP2 stream, server-side events, you name it, there's a bunch of bi-directional communication protocols out there right now. We are going to look at WebSockets because it's one of the oldest ways to communicate in a bi-directional way between the client and the server. What this means is no longer is only the client able to send requests to the server about new data, like is, is anything new? Is anything new? But we can have a bi-directional communication between the client and the server where both of them can send data to each other. So the server can push data and the client can request it. In this tutorial, we will cover WebSockets, what they are, how they work, and how we can use them in Go to communicate between servers and clients. We will explore some common pitfalls that I've seen in WebSocket APIs and how we can solve them. One of them uh, such as authentication. Uh, there's no support in WebSockets by default for authentication. You have to solve that on a uh, higher level, on the HTTP layer. During this tutorial, we will be building a chat application where you can enter different chat rooms and send messages. And the web server will be written in Go, and the client will be written in simple HTML and JavaScript. And the patterns we learn today can easily be, uh, be applied and adapted to different programming languages. So uh, you don't have to focus just on the languages used. Uh, you should be able to easily rewrite this using React or a Go client, for instance. So before we begin coding, let's understand just quickly what WebSockets are. So WebSockets are defined in RFC 645. If you want to go really deep, you can look that up. Um, but WebSockets uses regular HTTP to initialize the communication. And let's go ahead and look at a simple step-by-step. -step. Basically, it begins with the client sending a HTTP request to the server uh, but this HTTP request will contain a special HTTP header, which is the connection upgrade. Basically, we, the client tells the server that, hey, I'm using HTTP right now, but I want to upgrade this connection. And if the server is supporting WebSockets, it will respond with an HTTP 101 switching protocol. So basically, hey, I want to upgrade the protocol we are using to communicate, and the server will respond with, hey, sure, let's do that. And then a uh, long um, running WebSocket will be connected between the client and the server uh, using TCP. And it will be uh, connected until either party sends a close message. So both the server and the client can close the connection whenever they, they feel like they're done. This is how you connect a WebSocket, basically. It's a really simple protocol. Uh, there's nothing more to this. Uh, but if you really want to dive deep into the internal workings, you can look at the RFC. Um, so why, do you, why would we need WebSockets? Uh, I mean, they are very common in chat applications when you have one client sending a message that's supposed to be distributed to all other clients. So you would have a WebSocket between the server and all the clients, and whenever somebody pushes a message, it will get pushed to all the other clients. WebSockets are also commonly used in games. Uh, if you have a multiplayer game that is web-based, for instance, 
and you can then use WebSockets to push data to everyone who is connected currently. Uh, we see WebSockets in uh, real-time data uh, applications where you have this live feed or whatever. Um, and basically, anytime you need data, just quickly pushed out to the client. We will begin by setting up a simple HTTP server uh, that uh, hosts our web application using a file server. And we will do all this in Go. And I will refrain from using any web frameworks for now just to make this tutorial uh, smaller and simpler. We will use vanilla JavaScript. And hopefully, you know some JavaScript. And I kind of expect you to be somewhat familiar with Go. Um, but let's begin. Let's begin by making myself smaller. And let's move myself up here. Fine. Right, so let's begin by creating a module. So creating my module, and we're going to create a new file called main.go, which will be running our server. Um, we're gonna start out without using any WebSockets. We just want the whole uh, bulk of the application to be up and running. Um, so let's go ahead and do a package main. And we are having a main, and we will call a function called setup API. Now, setup API will be responsible for setting up the HTTP routes that we have. Currently, we will only have a file server, so we're going to host the HTML and JavaScript stuff using a regular file server. So let's make an import. So what we have here, we have setup API. Setup API will handle the uh, base routes and it will host a file server and it will host the directory which is located in the relative path of called front end. Now we don't have that path yet. So let's go ahead and create it. We have front end and we don't have uh, a front end, so let's build that. It's going to be a really simple uh, HTML. Now, let's. I'm going to quickly fill this with some mock data, dummy data, um, whatever, and we're going to have a HTML body, and let's make some quick headers, like uh, a tile, and let's call it web sockets with programming Percy. We don't need anything more. Uh, let's go ahead and create a body. Now we're going to use HTML to render the information that we are using. And we're going to use JavaScript to connect to the WebSocket. Uh, let's go ahead and do a div class. I'm going to add some CSS as well. Um, the reason why we are coding this live or is because I really don't like tutorials where they kind of go and, oh, you know, here you have a bunch of code, jump right in, let's go. Uh, hopefully I can show you guys how easy this is to set up. So let's create a chat application, some titles, which shows currently we are showing a hard-coded chat room, which is general, which is the place where everybody will go. Now, we're going to allow our clients to select which chat room they are a part of. So we're going to have a form. And we're not going to have an, any action because we are going to trigger a WebSocket event whenever they change the chat room. We're not going to make the form send a post request. And let's just leave a label so they can enter what chat room they want to be in. And we're going to have text. And it's going to be an ID of chat room. So we can easily select it. And let's have it called chat room in name as well. And let's break the row. And let's break the row. And we're going to have another, which will be the submit button. Uh, so they, whenever they press this form, they will actually change the chat room. Whenever they submit, this form will trigger a um, event on the 
WebSocket, which will change the user's current chat room. Uh, there's no logic applied to this yet, but we will add that very soon. Let's add a text area where the, um, called message area. And this is the location where we will uh, show any data that has been sent on the web sockets. Let's call it chat messages, read only, because we don't want them to modify this. And we are naming it. And, and let's add some rows. So we want to have, this is just purely styling. Let's add four rows and let's just make 50 columns. That's so it's, uh, it's 50 characters long and let's say some placeholder, welcome to chat room. And let's close it. Let's close the text area like that. Like that. And after the text area, let's break the row and let's have a simple form again where they can enter messages. So it will be chat room message, for instance, and we will have a label for um, messages. And let's just put it like that. And we will get the input value. So we will have a text input. Uh, let's call it message and Let's name it message. Let's just break the row once or twice. So we have a little bit of space and we're going to add a submit button. And the value will be send message. So we have a, we have a few headers showing them that this is a chat room. We have a form where they can select the chat room to be in. We are showing the chat messages and we have a form where the users can send any message that I want. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and add a script tag, which is where we will maintain our JavaScript. Uh, I just want to be perfectly clear that this is not how I recommend you to structure your web application. This is just to show you how we can easily get started with WebSocket. Let's have a default chat room selected and we're going to have a function called change chat room which will allow the users to change the chat room and we're going to do document get element by id and i think we called it chat room we did call the yes so the input value we're going to grab is called chat room and let's just add some checks so if it isn't null and if new chat dot value isn't selected chat because if they are already inside of the chat room we don't want them to switch chat room you should only be able to switch to a new chat room and we're going to return false now we are returning false because we're going to call this function from the form later and if we don't return false, the form will try to navigate to a URL, but we don't want to navigate away from this website. So we are always returning false. Returning false will make the submit button not try to navigate. So we can change chat room. We also need to be able to send messages. So we have exactly the same thing, basically. Let's just copy that function because we're going to do the same thing, but instead we're going to grab the message ID. And I guess we can do new message, let's copy that. And we don't need to check if we're in the same chat room. So whenever there's a new message, we want to print that. Now, whenever somebody visits our website, we want them to connect using their web socket. So let's make um let's make the let's enable that but let's not connect yet we have nothing to connect to but let's make sure that we are ready to connect whenever we have the server up and run so w whenever the window on load is called which is when they open up our website we are going to grab 
the chat room selection and we're going to apply on submit so whenever they are pressing the submit button on the form we are going to call the change chat room function so we have a function which prints the new chat room that is selected and whenever they press the submit button on the chat room selection form we will trigger this function that's what we are doing here we're applying a listener to the on submit uh, function and we're going to do the same for chat room messages but instead of change chat room we're going to call the send message so now we have that in place uh, we are going to do one final piece before we start uh, fixing the server and all the browsers have the window object and to check if the browser supports WebSockets, we're going to see if the WebSocket is, window WebSocket is available. And let's just make a console log for now. This is the place where we will connect very soon. Connect to WebSockets. But we can't connect right now, so let's just make sure browser does not support web sockets right we have the javascript in place so we can send messages we can change chat rooms uh, let's add some super fast styling just because we want this to look not good but just slightly better than what we have uh, we're going to overflow i won't cover what i'm doing with css uh, this is uh, I can't expect you to understand somewhat what we're doing. Let's make it fill the whole, and I'm gonna try speeding through this so that we are actually have a color predefined. So let's use that. It's kind of a gray, cool stuff. And let's whenever we we're, whenever we're in the center. On auto margin, we're gonna have a width of 50%. This is so our little chat screen will cover half a slight border so we see where we are. And that's right. So we have a super simple website that will display the data. We have a super simple HTTP server. So let's go ahead and run it and see that we are actually doing the correct thing. So, right, right, uh, my bad. Uh, nothing is happening because we actually need to start listen and serve, and we're going to listen on port 8080, and we're going to return nil whenever there's an issue. Let's see, now we start it, and we can visit localhost 8080, and you should be seeing, and we visit the local, and if we visit localhost 8080 now, we should be seeing this. We have the chat room where we can select, we can, we can see messages in the future, and we can send messages here by pressing this button and filling some things. Great, we have the foundation up. Let's see if we can start using WebSockets now. So let's begin by connecting our front end to our back end using a WebSocket. Now in JavaScript, it's super easy. There's a built-in WebSocket library that you can use without importing anything, and it comes built in with the browsers. So we can create a new client by just saying new WebSocket, and it accepts a URL. Uh, and the URL is going to be prefixed with the protocol to use. Uh, let us open it up to show you guys. So if we go down here where we say we're going to connect to the WebSocket, let's actually do, we can do new WebSocket and it accepts the URL. Now the URL is going to be localhost in our case, but we need to prefix it with the protocol. And I need to mention that there are two protocols when using WebSocket. There is the WS, which stands for WebSocket, and there is the WSS, which stands for WebSocket Secure. 
basically it's using HTTPS or HTTP. So WS is HTTP, 2SS for secure is HTTPS. But we need a um, certificate to host this and I won't cover that until the end of the tutorial. Uh, but I recommend you to use W uh, secure mode whenever it's possible. So we're going to connect a new WebSocket to a local host and let's do document dot location host plus slash WS. So this will connect using the WebSocket protocol to a local host 8080 slash double uh, slash WebSocket. Now, the reason I use slash WebSocket is because we will be hosting a slash WebSocket API endpoint in the server, which is used to do the connection. Uh, this is kind of normal. You usually see slash WS when there's a WebSocket um, involved. And let's store the connection in a variable, which we can use later. Now, if we go ahead and open up the front end and open the developer view, and we should, if we visit the website, we should see there's a problem with applying the handler on submit. So there's an issue on chat room selection. Let's go up and see. All right, my bad. I typed in the wrong name in the sh in the form ID. It should be chat room, not chat rom. Um, so if we go ahead and save that and we reopen, we should now see no errors, but we do see an error that we cannot connect the web socket. And if we open the network tab, you can go here and see the HTTP headers. And you can see the connection. Hopefully you can see the connection. Let me zoom in. You can see here the connection upgrade header that has been sent to the server, indicating that we want to use a, a web socket. Sadly, our backend does not yet support WebSockets, so we will get this error. However, let's go ahead and upgrade the backend so it actually can accept this request. Now, in the backend, I will be adding a manager.go. The manager will be used to manage anything related to the WebSocket. And I'm going to add it in the main package. And we're going to use Gorilla. Uh, Gorilla is a, a Gorilla is a very common uh, developer who have a lot of libraries out there, and they have a WebSocket library which is super common, which I do recommend. And let's go ahead and go get it. So go get GitHub, go get GitHub.com/Gorilla slash web sockets. And we have that. Uh, the first thing we're going to do in our manager is we're going to create something called a web socket upgrader. And it's part of their uh, the web socket library. Now the web socket upgrader is used to take an HTTP request and upgrade it upgrade it into a web socket connection instead of regular HTTP request. So you're going to see how smooth this is in a second. Let me, we're, it's not a function, so let me upgrade that to that. And I'm going to set a read buffer size and a write buffer size. Um, this is just to make sure that our clients doesn't send these huge, huge, huge package uh, packages. Um, we will cover more on that later. So let's create a manager struct. And we're going to create a factory function for new manager, which returns a pointer to a manager. And right now, the manager won't have any data. It will just be an empty structure. Um, but the manager will have a serve WebSocket function, which is a HTTP handler. So we need to... Uh, we need to have the HTTP handler signature, which is accept the response writer and a request as second parameter. And we're going to log that we have a new connection. And we're going to upgrade the um, request. So remember, whenever this function will be called, it will be when we receive a 
request from the clients to upgrade the regular HTTP connection. So upgrade regular HTTP connection into WebSocket. And to do this, we use the WebSocket upgrader that we created before. And we use the upgrade function. We take the response writer, we take the request, and we can leave the uh, header as nil for now. Let's just check that we, let's just print the errors for now. This is not a real application. Let's not handle, we don't want to focus too much on that. For now, we're not doing anything. Let's close the connection whenever we're done. Um, so the manager now has the po possibility to accept WebSocket connections. We just need to make sure that our API also actually handles this gracefully. So in the setup API, I will create a new manager calling the new manager function. And then right below here, let's add the endpoints. And let's do handle func. Remember, it's at slash WebSocket, uh, which is what the front end will expect. And we are calling the manager serve WebSocket handler. So whenever we get a new request now at slash WebSocket, the manager will take that request and upgrade it into a WebSocket. This is fairly, fairly simple, I believe. So let's let's go ahead and run it. Go run startup go because we have multiple Golang files. And, and as you see, when we visit the website, we no longer have an error. If we go to the network tab, we can, let's open this up. And let's make this a little bit bigger so you guys can see it. Let's zoom in. And you can see that the request was sent for the WebSocket API. It's a regular HTTP GET method. And we see that the response we got was 101 switching protocols. And hopefully you remember the, the WebSocket standard that we discussed before. We send a connection upgrade, and we receive a 101 that we're now switching a protocol. You can see here in the developer tool that we have this messages field. And here we will be able to see any messages that are sent over the WebSocket in the future. That's good to know. So the WebSocket request that was sent, go to that, go to messages, and you should be able to see the requests that are being sent over the WebSocket. That is very good to know in the future. Right, so we are now, we actually have a server and client who are connected by WebSockets, and this is all it took. However, we are not doing very much with it for now, so we are going to upgrade this a bit, of course. So one of the first things that we want to fix is that right now we are handling all the logic inside of the serve WebSocket handler. <clears throat> now, I like separating uh, stuff, so we already have a manager, but I'm going to go ahead and create a new file and call it client.go. And client.go will be handling everything related to a single client. So whenever we have a new person connecting, it will create a client in the backend, which we can use to manage it. <clears throat> so. Let's go ahead and create the client struct. And each client is uh, has a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the WebSocket connection. So say we have a WebSocket connection per client. And also I like to have a pointer to the manager who manages the client. Um, and we will see more on that later. And again, let's create a factory for the clients. And each client will accept a WebSocket connection and a manager, which we can reference. And we will return a pointer to our client. So let's turn a client and connection will be the con. And the manager will be the manager inserted. Now the reason for this is because we, from the clients, we'll do some stuff to direct it to the manager, like broadcasting to other clients and stuff. And this way we uh, have that opportunity. So let's also make a client list, which is a type. Uh, and the type is a map holding the clients as keys 
and just a bool to make sure they are there. Now, this is what we need in the client. And we also need to update the manager so the manager can maintain these clients. So let's jump back to the manager. And in the manager, we will update it so that we have a client, which is a client list. So that's a map of clients. And since we can have many people concurrently connecting to the API, we need to make sure that we protect this by a read write mutex. Let's also update the, the factory function to create the client list whenever we create a manager so we don't get a nil pointer exception. Now, we will inside the manager also add some helper functions for adding and removing clients to the manager. So let's go ahead and say that whenever we have a, in the serve WebSocket, what we want to do is we want to accept it, we want to upgrade it. And whenever we, we do that, we actually want to remove the con, we don't want to close the connection right away, but we want to create a new client. So we're going to create a new client and we're going to pass in the connection that we just upgraded and the manager, which is ourselves for now. And then we want to add this client to the manager. So that's what we're going to build, but it's going to be M add client and we're going to pass in the client. So, Let's go ahead and build that function right away. So pointer reference and add client. We accept a client as input and we return nothing because there's nothing to return. So let's go ahead and lock the manager. Oh, let's see. Manager, my mistake. So we're gonna lock the manager so that no, when we have two people connecting at the same time, we won't modify the map at the same time and have a collision. And whenever we're done, we're gonna unlock the manager. So let's check if this client is already connected. And we can do that. Uh, what did we name? Okay. So in here, the manager client list, let's name it clients instead. Makes more sense. So let's check if the client is part of the map. And if he is, we're going to actually delete. We're actually going to, oh, sorry. My bad, we're not going to delete him. Um, whenever a new client is added, we're going to add him to the map and just add a bool that he is connected. Now, this is concurrently safe and we're fine, but let's also, the thing I was doing, remove clients. So again, we accept a client as input, we lock and we defer on unlock. So if okay, we're going to check if the client exists. And if the client exists, we're going to close the connection and we're going to delete him from the client's list. So what we have here is we have an add client, which just simply whenever we have a new connection, we add them to the manager and we can also remove them, which we will uh, implement later, but it will remove the client from the client list. And this way we have a little bit more nicer structure when we keep improving what the client can do. Uh, we won't have this massive blob of code inside the serve WebSocket. So now that we have our clients in place, we can start implementing some logics for our clients, such as reading and writing messages. And this is pretty this is a pretty easy task. Reading and writing messages on the WebSocket is a really easy task, but there are a few things that people usually miss out. And you won't notice them at first because it will work. But one of those uh, mistakes is the WebSocket connection from the Gorilla package actually only allows one concurrent writer at a time. And if we do write messages straight to the connection, it will probably work unless we have a lot of traffic. But if somebody spams or if we have a ton of clients sending on the connection or we will have a problem. But there's an easy fix to this. We can use an unbuffered channel to prevent the connection from getting too many writes at the same. We will cover this uh, really soon, but let's go ahead 
and open up the manager and inside here, inside the serve WebSocket, once we have added the client, we will actually start two go, go routines per client. One will be to read messages and one will be to write messages. Uh, and let's go ahead and do go client dot read messages. We will very shortly uh, jump into the client and implement the read messages also. So whenever a client connects, we add it to the client list and we also start a process which reads messages. So let's go ahead and take a look at read message. Um, the connection has a read message function. So let's just create the function and we're going to have a client read messages. And in here, we're going to have a loop that runs forever. And inside this loop, we will check for messages. And the client connection has a read message. And if we take a look at it, you can see it outputs three types, the message type, the data payload, and an error. Now, the message type, let's go ahead and say message type, payload, and error. Message type is defined in the RFC. There's a few different message types. You have ping, pong, data, binary message, and you can read more about them in the RFC if you're interested. Usually, you only use uh, like a few of them, either binary or text data. Now, let's go ahead and first check if it returns any error. So you might wonder when it will return an error. And it will return an error whenever the connection is closed or is unexpectedly closed for some reason. So let's go ahead and make sure that we actually, uh, first off, we want to break the forever loop if the connection is closed. So, but let's also go ahead in the WebSocket, we have a, a few helper functions to check this fun uh, the error. One of them is, is unexpected closed error, which will be thrown if we try to read from a connection which, which has been closed. So we're going to check if it's, if the error we got is either WebSocket close going away and we will also check if it's websocket close abnormal and if it's any of these errors so if the connection is closed or abnormal closed for some reason we want to log that and in this application i will simply print it to the uh, standard out but you might want to handle that in a real application. Now let me make this clear what's going on. We get an error from the read message whenever something is wrong or the connection is closed. But if this is a regular close, if the connection is closed in a normal fashion, the client sent a close and the connection closed, we don't want to log that maybe because that's not really an error. That's why we check for the abnormal closes. So whenever we get to this log statement, the connection has closed without the client or server sending a close message. Something has gone wrong, so we want to log it. Otherwise, we will simply break. Now, whenever that happens, we want to remove the client from the manager. So I'm gonna put a defer function up here because this break will close the for loop and the, the go routine here will actually end. It's so it will trigger this one. So clean up connection here, which we will do by going to the manager and removing the client. Now remember, remove client will close the connection, remove it from the client list. So we actually have a nice solution to clean up clients who are exiting or having network issues or whatever. So let's just go ahead and print out the message type for now and let's print out the payload for now. And let's print the payload as a string because it's a byte array, so we want to read it. So this, this is how we read messages. We call the read message. It will return an error if the connection is closed. So we need to make sure that the close is normal 
And unless, unless it is normal, we want to log it because then we have an actual error. And if the connection is closed, we want to trigger the function to remove the client from the backend. So we're cleaning up anything. Great. So we can actually test this uh, really quickly. So we can now read messages. Let's go back to the front end and let's go up to the send message. Right now, we're only logging the message on the console, but let's go ahead instead and send the WebSocket message. Now, sending messages in JavaScript is really easy. Remember, we have the connection assigned here, and we can actually easily, in the send message here, do connection.send, because we want to send a message, and we can do new message value. So we will take whatever the user has inserted into the form and send it on the connection. As easy as that, nothing else. So let's go ahead and restart our Golang program. So the server has booted up. Let's open up the UI once more. And this time, let's keep this, let's clear the log and let's restart the application. So we have a WebSocket connection up Let's go ahead and type by a message here. Hello, and let's send that message. And you can see here that the message was sent on the WebSocket. You can see the payload here, hello. So let's go back to the back end, and we can see two things being printed. We have one, which is the message type. So this is a message type of one, and you could probably go here to see the message types. We can probably find them declared uh, inside of here. So in Gorilla, you can see the message type defined. This is from the RFC. This is not related to Gorilla. This is all. So you can see here, we print a one because the message type is a one. So it's a text message. It could be a binary message. It could be a closed message, ping, or pong. So these are the message types that we can expect. Now, we are not going to do anything particular with this, but it's useful if your server accepts different kinds of messages. Like if you accept binary or text messages, you can kind of have a switch based on the message type. We can also see the payload being printed, hello. So this is really nice. Our server can now accept messages, read them and print them. We've come a long way. Now. Do you remember that I said that the connection could only write one message at a time? And this will be a problem if we're doing concurrent stuff, which we are. Uh, so we'll actually need to update this. And Gorilla themselves have an example of this. And the way they recommend you to solve it is using an unbuffered channel, which blocks any concurrent writes to the connection. So whenever a client tries to send a message, we won't do client.connection.write message because that would allow one client to spam 100 messages and they would be concurrently written. We don't want that. Instead, whenever a client writes a message, we want to take that message and write it to an unbuffered channel, which we then read from. This way we can control so that we always only write one message at a time. I hope that makes sense. It's sort of like a, a gate, you know? You can, you can, the client can spam messages, but they won't go directly to the connection, but they will be taken one by one from the channel instead. So let's go ahead and update the client. The client wants an egress which is used to avoid concurrent writes on the WebSocket connection. That's what we want to achieve. So let's create a, a egress, which is a channel which we write byte, byte arrays to. Let's go down to the factory function and make sure that we create the channel whenever we create a new client. So it's time to go to the manager the same way we did with read messages, we want to do go client.read.write messages. So whenever we get a new client, we want to start a process which writes messages. I suppose this could be inside add client. 
but let's keep it up here now for now. Let's go to clients. Let's go down. Let's make a new function, which is write messages. And this is going to do the same thing. So whenever we have something break, we're going to go to the manager and remove the client. So this, this defer is here to help us clean up any unused clients or clients that are having issues. And we're going to have a for loop again, which runs forever. But this time, we're going to have a select. And some of you are probably going to be wondering why I'm doing for select right now, instead of just a for range on the loop. But we're going to add more stuff to the select later. So bear with me. That's why we have a select here. So we're going to accept and we're going to check messages and OK from whatever the egress channel has. So we're going to read all the messages from the egress. And we're going to use uh, the payload. And OK is the bool uh, mentioning that egress is fine and still up. So the first thing we want to do is check, is the channel still up? Because if OK is false, that means the egress channel has closed for some reason. And if we have closed, let's go ahead and be nice guys and have our WebSocket connection write a message to the client. So the server will write a message here because we, have, we are having issues with our egress. And the reason for this can be multiple stuff. Probably we removed the client or something went wrong. We have to notify the, the the other side of the connection that this connection has to be closed. So we're going to send a close message. And the payload that we're sending is going to be nil. The second parameter is the payload. It's going to be nil. So let's do a check if error is nil. And if we have trouble sending, we probably have closed the connection. So we try to send a message to the client that we are closing the connection. But if we can't, the connection has probably been closed. And we're going to return. The return is going to break the for loop, which will trigger the cleanup. But if we were successful and we could receive a message, we're going to try and go to the connection and write the message. So WebSocket, we're going to send a text message. We're going to send the payload as it is. And we're going to check if we can send it. And fail to send message. And let's change this to a printf. And let's log that the message was sent. So <clears throat> what we have here in short terms, instead of having each client writing directly on the connection, which we're not allowed to do because it can't handle concurrent writes. Instead, when messages are sent, we will write them to the egress channel. And the egress channel will one by one select the messages and actually fire them away on the web socket. This way, we have a concurrently safe solution, which is really the way to go. So now that we have this in place and we're listening on the egress, we actually have to have something right to the egress. And that is something we can solve for now by making sort of a loop. There's no process right now that writes messages to the egress, but we can make a quick hack to test it and see that everything is working as expected. We will make a small hack right now. And the hack will be that every time we read a message, we will send it to all the other clients. We'll broadcast each message. And so let's have a for loop. And we will loop all the WebSocket clients. And we will go to the manager and the client list. And for each client and each egress channel, we will write the payload. This is just a hack for now to make sure that the egress is really working. We're not writing any unit tests. That's not what we're learning here today. So whenever I restart now, 
whenever a client is reading a message, it should also broadcast these payloads to all the other clients. And those will be read and written to the, those clients in a concurrent way. So before we try this, let's update the front end so that the front end also can receive the payloads that are written using the right message. And before we do that, we need to discuss a little bit about the events that WebSockets have. So the WebSocket has a few events which you need to learn. And they are close. And the close event fires whenever the WebSocket closes. Easy. Error whenever there's an error. There's a message whenever the WebSocket receives a message. And there's an open, which will trigger whenever the WebSocket is open. So uh, like many times you can have like whenever the WebSocket connection closes, maybe you want to reconnect if the WebSocket is vital for your application. Uh, or you want to show the user some kind of error, like we don't have a connection right now. Um, but what we are interested in is the on message. And we right now we only want to try if the right message is actually working as expected. So let's go ahead and do connection on message because we are listening on the we are listening on the message event. So we are accepting an event and we're going to print the event. And that's it. That's what we need to change on the front end. So we can go ahead and restart the back end. And we can actually try this now by opening up and clearing the, refreshing the website. We can go here and we can send a message, test. So we can see that the message test was sent and we can see that the message was actually received here. So we're receiving the message that we sent ourselves. And that's because right now inside the client read message, when every message that goes through the WebSocket will be sent to all other clients. This is probably not how you want it, but we can verify that our solution actually works. So whenever we send a message, we get the message event and it's being printed. So I hope that makes sense. Like the whole reading and writing messages, it's not really, from a code perspective, it's not really hard. What makes it a bit confusing is the whole, we, is the egress channel. But just try to, try to think that we don't want to write a million messages at the same time. The connection can't handle that. We want one message at a time. So instead we have this pipeline in front of it, which we write to, which handles the processing. Now, this is great. We can connect between the client and server. We can send and receive messages. And this is all great. And we basically have a basic setup for a WebSocket API up and running. Now, one thing I kind of like to do is having some sort of events or type system in place that makes scaling the implementation a lot easier. What this means is basically that I like implementing some sort of RPC system uh, or basic format that is sent on the WebSocket. Because as you know right now, we can send any kind of text message. There's no control on how that text message should look. There's no typing at all. And basically, the, if we have one kind of message, in, as in this case, we have a chat which sends, sends, receives, and outputs to all other clients. That's fine. That's easy. And it works. But what if we have two different things we want to do? Say, change chat room. Now, the way you do this, or can do this, or have multiple other scalable things happening is that we can kind of wrap each payload inside of a event class. And basically each message that is sent is wrapped inside the event. And we can use, um, we can have a type field on the event, which tells us what to do with the message. So we can use that to route the message. Let's go ahead and take a look. Let's go to the front end first. And let's go up at the beginning here of the script tag. Let's go ahead and add a new class called event. This is what we will be sending and receiving 
through the web socket. And this will allow us to have more control of whatever users are sending and so we can know what to do with it. And we will want a type and a payload. This is very similar to how web sockets work. You send the message type or binary type or whatever and the payload so that the receiver knows how to handle it. Basically, we're doing this, but our payloads will be wrapped in a similar fashion. So whenever we create a new event, let's make the type into type and the payload we insert will become the payload. Now, this is what we will send and receive. So whenever we receive an event, we need to somehow manage them. Let's create a function called route event, which accepts an event as input. And let's see if the event type is undefined. We can't do anything if we don't know what type. So let's just alert for now. No type field in the event. So that's an error. We want to just alert that. Let's add a switch. And we will use the type field to switch. And how you implement this is basically up to you. I'm just suggesting that you can do something like this to have a more scalable approach to your WebSocket communication. Let's go ahead and say we have a new message event. And this will trigger whenever a new message is sent on the WebSocket. So what we will do is that we will, for now, just log it, new message. And we will break. And the default, what should the default be? Mm, let's alert, unsupported message. And let's break. So we have our event type. We have a route function which accepts the events and triggers a certain feature based on the event type. Now let's add one more uh, nice little helper, which will be send event. And send event will accept the event name and the payload. This is just a wrapper so we can uh, send different events from the front end uh, in a unified way. So let's say we will create a new event and we will insert the event name, which is the type and the payload. And then we will do connection.send. And we will always want to send the events as JSON. So this little helper feature will take the event name, take the payload and uh, JSON it and send it away on the connection. So once we have this, we can go down to send message which is no longer gonna send on the connection by itself, but instead we're going to call the send event function. Send event, and we're going to say send message event, and let's put in new message.value as payload. Now, what we have is the ability to send messages, but the messages will be parsed uh, or formatted as an event type. And let's also go ahead inside here. Whenever we receive a message, we don't want to simply print it, but we will expect events to come back from the WebSocket as well. We send it in the event format. We also expect it in the event format. So let's go ahead and do event data equals, and we will JSON parse the actual data from the event. So the payload that is received on the WebSocket will be parsed and we will store it as that. Now we know that it should be formatted as our event class. So let's go ahead and just simply assign it. Object.assign new event and we will want to assign the JSON data. And now we have an event object. We want to route that event. So instead of printing the messages, whenever we receive them, we will parse them with the JSON. We will uh, create an event object from them and we will route that event object. So this should lead, whenever we receive new message, should be printed to the console. Great. Now, hopefully that works as we expected to. Uh, however, the backend has no idea about the event. So we kind of need to reapply this in the backend. We want to do the same thing in the backend. Depending on the event type, we want to route it. 
and we want also to make sure all outgoing messages are formatted in this event format. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file, and I'm going to call it event.go. And this will maintain all our event-related stuff. So let's have an event struct, and let's make sure we have the JSON type, um, type and we also have the payload. We don't want to marshal the payload. We want to leave it as it is. So I'm going to say that it's a JSON raw message, and we call it payload. So this structure here is the same as the class that we're sending from the front end. Now, <clears throat> the reason why we leave this as a raw message is because the user should be able to put whatever payload they want. And uh, this way, we won't marshal it. And that will allow them to send JSON blobs in whatever way they want. Uh, so our different events can kind of expect different formats internally. So that's really nice. When a message is received in the backend, we will use the type field, same as in the front end, to route it to the appropriate event handler. Now, an event handler is a function which will perform some kind of action based on the event that is received. So let's go ahead and create the event handler. And it's a function signature, which accepts an event and the client to send the event and outputs an error. Now, this is how our functions will look that can be applied to the WebSocket API. So let's go ahead and implement the first one, which we have already created in the front end. So we create a, so let's create the event send message which is the event that we will send whenever a new message is sent from the client. And let's take a look at the JSON raw message that I was explaining. So different kind of event handlers will probably want different kinds of payload. So the payload for sending a message may be not be the same as changing the chat room that we want to be in. So we can modify these and have different kinds depending on the event handler that is triggered. In our case, whenever a new message is sent, let's create a new send message event. And we will want to send the actual message that the user is sending. Let's say that that is encoded in message. And we want to know from who it is. So let's add that. So whenever a uh, send message event is triggered, we will expect a JSON blob with the message and the from fields to be the payload. Basically. Now we have the events on the front end. We have the events on the back end. What we need to do now is we need to make sure that the manager knows how to route these events. And I like to store it in the manager. You, can, you could store it in the client as well. It depends a little bit how you structure your application. But I love having it in the manager because usually in the manager, I have database repositories and stuff, and I can do things from there. So we need a way to store these handlers. And you can have it as functions and a simple um, switch statement. But a switch statement can become really, really, really long if you have many handlers. So it's not really nice. I try to avoid switch statements whenever I can. Now, we can actually do this. So in the manager, let's go ahead and add a new field. It's going to be the handlers, which will be our event handlers. So let's make it a um, map with a string as key. And the idea here is that the type will be used as the key and allow us to grab the event handler. So let's go ahead and modify the factory as well. This time, let's do it like this. We want to store the manager. And whenever we create the manager, we want to also create the handlers. So let's make a map string event handler. And let's call a function. Let's call it setup event handlers. And we're going to return. And we need to create that function, uh, set up event handlers. And basically, right now we only have one event, and it's the send message event. So 
m handlers event send message is going to be a function and let's that function is going to be and the send function right now let's just make it print whatever we receive so let's create a function that actually fulfills the event handler signature so we're going to have a func it's going to be send message let's just name it whatever for now and we will accept an event we will accept a client and we will trigger an error and we will print let's print the event when it is received and return a nil so let's assign that function to the event handler so whenever we look for this event we will find this function and it will trigger a, a print line now we're not entirely done we need to route them we need to check the map somewhere so the same way we did in the front end let's have a route events function it's going to be part of the manager this time route events and the input will be the first parameter will be the event and the second will be the client and we will output an error so we're going to do a check in the manager's handlers if the event type is present and if it is we're going to execute the handler with the event and the client i hope that makes sense to you guys and let's return nil if not and if we don't find the event let's have an else statement let's return error new uh, there is no such event type so what's happening is that first we check if the event type is part of the handlers which is a map which uses the event type as key so whenever we receive a message that has the type set to send message we will trigger send message and that will print and that is handled here because we search for it and if we find it the function is stored in the handler and then we execute handler basically by passing in event and the client and so we are almost ready to test this we have one final piece that we need to implement before we can test it and that's uh, the read and write messages in the clients they need to respect that we are now using events instead. So we're going to make a small adjustment. Firstly, the event egress is going to accept events. It's not going to say raw bytes anymore. It's going to accept events. So let's change that. And once we do, we need to modify the read message. So in the read messages, we will remove all of this. And inside here, we will create a event structure so remember we are receiving a message and we can remove the message type right now we're we're only sending text types so what we are doing is we are expecting the payload that is received to be in the event format so let's go ahead and marshal the payload that we have received into our newly created event and let's if we don't get it let's just say error marshalling event and let's just print it for now and let's break maybe maybe you shouldn't break here i mean if they send one message wrong maybe it's a bit harsh to close the connection because if we break here you will clean up but i mean maybe log it whatever in this case let's break now here we have an event which means we can actually go to the manager and do manager route event and we can route the event and the client it is from and let's check if there's any errors and let's just print it so now the server expects events to be parsed and whenever they are parsed we are routing them and allowing the manager to handle them 
Also, we need to do the same thing in the right uh, messages. But instead here, we're receiving them. So let's marshal instead. Let's marshal the message so we get the JSON data. And let's print errors. I love how we print all the errors. Don't do that in a real application. Handle the errors somehow. And let's see, we should replace the message here with data. And that's everything. Now we can go ahead and restart and we're gonna test this out. So basically what we have changed is that we send and receive events, which looks like this. They have a type, they have a payload, I mean, you can add more stuff here. And the payload is basically generic or not generic, but the payload is handled by the event handler function. So it's up to the function. They will just receive the raw JSON. It's up to the function that receives it to handle it. So we have done this for the back end and the front end. So let's go ahead, open up the front end again. We can clear everything, we can reload. And if we go here now and do a message and we send that message and we can check it. You can see here, the message isn't et, 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 et or test if I send test, but it's actually formatted as an event. We have our type, which is send message and we have our payload, which is test in this case. Remember the payload can be a JSON object because we're expecting a raw message. And we can see from the back end, we are receiving the send messages. And since we are receiving them here in the read message, we are marshalling them and then we're routing them. And route event does have a send message handler because we added that in the setup event handlers. So here we say, whenever we receive send message, trigger this function. And this function will simply print the event. Great. So before we fix the event handlers to do what they are meant to do, because fixing that is a pure Go-based thing. It's not so much about WebSockets. That's more just brushing it up. The whole format and how to set event WebSockets up is basically done. There's a few things that you have to fix to make it really nice. And there's security and heartbeats. And we're going to start with heartbeats. So WebSockets allows both the server and the client to send a ping frame. And it's a special kind of message that is just used to check if the other side of the connection is still alive. And that's why it's called a heartbeat. So you can check like, hey, are you still awake? And if they don't respond, you can kind of assume that that connection has dropped and you can leave. Not only do we check if another connection is alive, but we can also keep connections alive. So a WebSocket that is idle for too long, remember, we're still kind of relying on the HTTP protocol here as a, we're wrapped inside of it. So if the keep alive uh, is triggered because nothing has happened, it will shut down. So we will use ping pongs to kind of keep idle connections alive for however long we want. Because if you're having a chat app, maybe you don't want to kick people after idling for one minute or so. Uh, so whenever a ping is sent, we want the other party to respond with a pong. And if no response is sent, we will assume uh, the connection is no longer alive. So to implement this, we actually only need to touch the server code because browsers by default using the WebSocket inbuilt, the inbuilt WebSocket will actually respond to ping messages by default. So you don't have to do anything on the front end. That is handled automatically, but we need to fix things on the back end. So let's go ahead and go into clients because this is client related. And let's define a few variables that we will use. And one of them is the pong wait. And pong wait is the duration for how long we will await the pong. 
But if I send a ping, I will wait a maximum of 10 seconds before I drop the connection. And we will create a second variable, which is the ping interval, which is pong wait times 9 e uh, divided by 10. Pong in ping interval is how often we will send pings to the client. Note that this has to be lower than the pong wait. If we have a ping interval that sends slower than the pong weights, the pong weight will always cancel. For instance, if we send a ping each 15 seconds, but only allow the server to wait five seconds between the pongs, the connection will be closed because there will be a 10 second gap. Uh, so always have a ping interval that is lower than the pong weight. Uh, also, we can't multiply by o, o, we can't multiply by 90%. Basically, this algorithm calculates 90% of this value. So um, that's what we do. So we allow the server to have a 90% time frame to wait between the pings. So we need to update the server to send the pings to the client. We will do this inside the client, and we will do this inside of the right messages. So inside write messages, we will create a ticker. So time new ticker, and it will tick depending on the ping interval. And this is why we have a select case here, because at the bottom, we will have a new thing to listen for. And it will be, let's see, so I go to the right place. Sorry, we should be here. So in case we receive a tick from the ticker, we will do log print line ping, and we will send a ping to the client. So the pinging is handled inside the client go routine. So let's do ahead and do connection, write message, WebSocket ping. There's a div, there's a, remember th this is a separate type, and it has to be the ping message, otherwise the front end won't know how to handle the message. And we will send an empty byte array. Uh, we don't have anything to send. So if this happens, and if error not equals nil, let's see. Oh, sorry, we need to do that. And let's just write message error in case something goes wrong. And we will return to cancel the go routine. Now, this simple change will make the clients send ping events to the front end and it will automatically return a pong. And we <clears throat> and the reason for this is because RFC tells us that the ping and pong messages should trigger automatically. Now the browser browsers that all support WebSockets today, they do this automatically, so you should have no issue unless you use a third party WebSocket implementation, then it can change. Um, so the server is sending pings to the client, the client responds with a pong, um, but what now? Uh, what we can do is we can handle a, we need to configure a pong handler. So we are sending pings and we're receiving pongs back, but we're not doing anything with the pongs. So whenever we receive a pong, we want to update the timers to reset because we have told the server or we will tell the server that we are waiting 10 seconds between each pong. So we actually need to handle that somehow. We need to tell the code that we have received a pong and we will reset the timer. So let's go to read message. And inside read message, before we start the for loop forever, we will configure a wait time how how long to wait for the pong. So let's go ahead and do if error connection set read deadline. And set read deadline is a, a function from the gorilla package which allow us to set a time for how long we should wait. So let's go ahead and do time that now and we will add pong wait. So we'll take the current time, we will add 
10 seconds to that, and that is how long we will wait for the Pong message to be received. So let's just print if this goes wrong. This shouldn't really fail ever, I think, because we're only setting a timer here. Now, we're setting the timeline for how long to wait for the Pong message when we start reading messages for the clients. We also need to update a handler. Luckily for us, we don't need to add a custom event for that, but Gorilla has a function called set Pong handler, which we can use to apply a certain handler that is used when the Pong is triggered. So whenever we receive a Pong message, it will trigger the function that we uh, assign here. So let's do client dot, let's call it Pong handler. And then let's go down to the bottom and let's create that function. So in the client, we will have a Pong handler and we're receiving a Pong message string error. And this is how the Pong handler should look. So let's print it, print line. Let's just print Pong. We have received a Pong and we need to reset the timer. Remember, because if we don't reset the timer, the timer will run out and close the connection. So let's return connection set read deadline, the same function that we started here. So we start the timer here and we wait for a Pong message. And when that Pong message is received, we reset it. So let's go ahead and do the same thing here. So we are using the current time we're adding the Pong weight limit. Great. Now we have pings and we have Pongs that will keep our connections alive. You can restart the back end and connect a client. Let's open the front end. Let's reconnect and let's go back. And now when 10, past, 10 seconds has passed, we should see a ping Pong. And as you can see here, we're receiving pings and we're receiving pongs. I can't stress how important it is that in the pong handler, you actually reset the timer. I've seen many people miss this and it's like, why is my connection just dying? Reset the timer and you're good to go. So implementing a ping pong uh, heartbeat is actually really easy using the Gorilla Mods. So another thing we need to fix when regarding security is that one rule in security is to always expect malicious, malicious usage. If people can do evil stuff, they will. And let's go ahead and implement a really easy fix for something called jumbo frames. So let's expect people to send really, really big messages. And we want to avoid that. And we can actually do that by setting a limit whenever we are reading a message in the backend. So the Gorilla WebSocket package has a set read limit, which will set the maximum size in bytes for how large the message that is received can be. And again, this is something you need to be a bit cautious with, and you should really know how long your messages can be. If you have a chat and you allow people to send messages that are more than I mean, unlimited in size, this is probably not a good idea. But if you know how big your messages are going to be generally, or if you have a limit on how large they can send you, you can calculate the byte size and use that to set a hard limit. And this is all you need to do. Inside the read, you need to set the limit. And if we start up and go to the front end, and if we restart the connection, and go here. And if we just, you know, let's go ahead and copy that and copy, 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 send a jumbo frame. We're going to see that this was sent. Let's go to the back end. And obviously, bam, it's just my computer is a little slow, but we closed the connection because the connection tried to send a massive amount of data and they shouldn't be allowed to. And if we try to send a new connection, we will see that it's closed. So we have fixed the so we have fixed the jumbo frames. Let's go ahead and fix another 
simple thing that is really important. And right now, anybody can connect from any domain. So we're going to apply a little course uh, stuff because we all love course. So inside the manager, we're going to create a function which checks the origin of the connection and uh, allow us to set that we only want to allow connections from certain origins. And this is to avoid cross-site request forgery. So it's really important that you actually do this. And to do this, we're going to create a new function and we're going to call it check origin. And we're going to accept a HTTP request and return a bool. This is the function signature that the WebSocket upgrader will expect. So um, if we return true, we will allow the connection. If we return false, we will dismiss the connection. So let's go ahead and grab the origin from the request and it's part of the header. So let's grab the origin header and we're going to make a switch origin. And in a real application, you should probably make the origins uh, like configurable from an environment variable or whatever. But for me, for now, I'm just going to allow anything from port 8080 localhost will be allowed. And we're going to set a default that will return false. So this function will allow anything from localhost 8080, which is where I currently host the API. So this function, we need to apply it. So scroll up to the WebSocket upgrader. And the WebSocket upgrader actually has a field called check origin. As you see here, it expects a function which has this signature, and that's exactly what we have created. So let's assign it, and we can restart the API, and everything should work as expected still when we visit. So let's go ahead and make a new connection, test. Let's go back. The message is sent. Let's close that. Let's try changing that. So I changed the port to 8081 instead. Let's go ahead and retry it. So whenever we connect from a domain that isn't, you can see here, the status was finished. We were not allowed to connect. And you can even see the logs. Request origin is not allowed. So this is good to limit from where your clients can connect. And it's really important that you do. So one other really important aspect of any API is that you sometimes is that you sometimes only want to allow connections that are authenticated, for instance. Now WebSockets doesn't come with any authentication utility built in, but uh, we can solve that pretty easily since WebSockets are built on top of HTTP. What we will do is we will implement a solution that authenticates the user before they connect to the WebSocket. And there's a few common ways of doing this. Uh, some time ago, uh, or a few years ago, um, WebSockets allowed basic authentication inside the URL. So you would do like, my name is Percy, my password, and the WebSocket URL. And it, will, it would automatically handle that for you. However, that has been deprecated and is no longer valid. So we need a new solution. There's two solutions I've seen out there, which I kind of both like, but I prefer one of them. So the first one that is widely used out there is that you have a regular HTTP endpoint that you can authenticate against, a simple slash login, for instance. And once you're authenticated, you will get back a one-time password or a ticket that allows you to connect to the WebSocket. This ticket can be added to the URL as a get parameter. Now, a second approach is that you allow users to connect the WebSocket, and then you allow them to send a authenticate uh, event or payload that allows them to authenticate and verify that they are allowed to connect. I prefer option number one, where we have this ticketing system, because we don't want uh, uh, like spammy bots to connect and drain resources when they shouldn't be allowed to visit the WebSocket. So let's implement option number one. 
And in our case, uh, the flow will be a user connect using HTTP. They get back an OTP or one-time password, um, and they send this back to the WebSocket uh, endpoint in the URL. And if it's valid, they get to, uh, to connect. And this will all take place in the serve WebSocket function. Um, so let's go ahead and start updating the front end. Enough talk. Um, let's go to index.html, uh, and we will update a few things. First, we want to notify the users that they actually are connected. So let's add a connection header, and we will say connected to WebSocket. False, hard-coded messages are the best. And let's go ahead and add a simple form down here so that the users can actually connect. Let's make it a little, let's have a border, three pixels, solid, black, and we're going to have a margin to the form above, right? And we will have a form and let's call it login form. And inside the form, we will allow users to insert the username, and this could be implemented into your current authentication uh, pretty easily, probably. Um, we're building it from scratch now, but in your application, if you already have an application and you already have that in place, you can probably just allow that endpoint to return the authentication ticket for the one-time password back. So let's go ahead and allow a label for passwords, and it will read password. This will be a really simple login. Uh, you shouldn't do this login in. Let me get that said. And we will do password and the name will be, let's go password. And that's the input. And let's break some rows. And let's, uh, we could just use the margin, but I'm lazy. Let's have a submit button and the value is login. So that's our simple form that will allow users to log in. Now, we still haven't updated the backend to accept logins, but we will do that shortly. But before we do that, we need to update the um, connection. Uh, because right now, we try to connect whenever they load the website. So we need to fix that. So I'm going to add a few uh, functions. Actually, the first first function I'm going to add is the login function, which will handle logins for us. And I will also get the form and assign login form, it's called. And on submit, we want to trigger login. So whenever they submit, we are triggering the login function. And now the login function will simply extract the data from the form. So we will have username and we will get element by ID. You could probably grab the form and then um, grab the form data from that instead. I'm doing this because it's a little bit quicker now in our uh, application. There's better ways to grabbing the form data. I just want to say that. <laughs> then whenever we have the form data, we want to send a fetch to slash login, right? And we want to, so fetch will send a post to slash login for us with the username and password. Uh, so let's go ahead and do a post and we want the body to be the JSON format of our form data. And let's do, so then if you're unfamiliar with JavaScript, um, What's happening here is fetch will send the request, but it won't wait for the request. It will return a promise. So whenever we say then, we will wait for that promise to actually finish, and then we will grab the response. So let's check if the response is OK. And if it is, we will return the JSON data that is returned from the endpoint. So this data here will be a JSON object and it will contain our one-time password. However, we don't care about that in this function. We only want to return the data. And if fails for some reason, we want to throw an unauthor unauthorized. And then 
when that is done, we want to grab the data that is returned. So the data here will be the response from this right here. So the data will be the JSON object. And here we want to, so at this, at this point of time, we are authenticated. So here we want to connect the web socket. And we know that the data returned will contain a one-time password in the OTP field. So let's go ahead and call connect web socket with the OTP as input. Now this function doesn't exist yet. We can, for clarity, we can do this function connect web socket OTP. We will cover this soon. So we will call this function, which will trigger the one, uh, WebSocket connection for us, along with the one-time path. And just for my peace of mind, if every, anything fails, we want to catch the failures, and we want to trigger an alert. Uh, and we want to return false, because we don't want that to switch website whenever the login is. Uh, so let's see. OK, this is it. The login function in the front end will send the form data to our endpoint. We will marshal the response of JSON, and we will trigger Connect WebSocket when we are authenticated. That seems about right. So let's fill the Connect WebSocket function. What we will do is actually take everything from the window on load, because we don't want to connect in the load function anymore. And window on load will simply be assigning our event listeners. So let's copy paste that part into the connect web stock. We need to modify it a bit because at the end of the URL, we want to append the OTP get parameter. So WebSocket doesn't allow you to pass data. It doesn't allow you to pass anything else other than the protocol and a URL. But the URL can contain get parameters. So that's what we're doing here. We're adding that. And this is also the reason why I don't want you to send like uh, JVT tokens and stuff in the URL. Uh, instead, we use a, a one-time password to make it a little bit more uh, secure. So uh, at this point of time, we are basically doing everything that we need to. We can just modify a few bits. We need to update the, um, the, the header whenever we connect. So let's go ahead and use the unopen. Unopen will trigger whenever the WebSocket is connected. So what we will do whenever a WebSocket is connected, we will do grab the element by ID, and we will grab the connection header. And the connection header, we will just simply update the HTML to connected to WebSocket true, something like that, I guess, suppose. And we also want to do the counterpart, which we can do whenever the WebSocket is closed. So on close. We just want to update that to false. Simple as that. So unopen op triggers whenever the connection connection is opened, and unclose will trigger whenever the connection is closed. Usually, unless unless it's a manual close, I can recommend you to have some sort of automatic uh, uh, reconnection in the unclose. If the connection dies due to the network dropping for the user or whatever for a few seconds, you want it to connect. Unless they manually close the connection. You don't want to re-authenticate them. OK, so the front end should basically be good to go right now. Uh, you could try it out. You could start the application. And you could visit the website. And we should. The form is here, so username and password, and we can go ahead and fill something, and we can log in. And you can see here, we're not connected to the WebSocket because our request should have failed. Let's see, do we see the, do, 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 do. let's go ahead. This is not so responsive. Let's go ahead and trigger a login, and we should see, oh, so here it is, get element by ID. not element by ID. So once we've changed the typo and we log in, we should see. So I made the same typo here. So if we change that, save that, go to the website and try to log in, we will get a pop-up saying we're unauthorized. 
because the request to slash login has failed. But at least we know the, the UI is doing what we expected. It's showing the WebSocket connection and it's not connecting the WebSocket, but unless we log in. So let's go ahead and try to fix the um, uh, backend now so that we actually accept the logins from uh, that location. Uh, and the first thing I think we should do is that we should create a new file and that file will be containing our one-time password solution. So I'm going to go ahead, go here, create a file called odp.go and odp.go will contain everything related to the one-time password. So let's go ahead, let's create a odp struct and we will have a key and we will have the time the one-time password was created. And let's also create something called a retention map. Let's call it retention map. And it will be a map with a string as key and a OTP as value. So the idea here is that this map will contain the one-time password key in the map and the one-time password as value. And the retention map will delete any one-time passwords that are too old. So let's go ahead and create a uh, factory for the one retention map. We will accept a context and we will accept something called a retention period, which is the duration for how long a one-time password is valid. After the time has passed, we should remove the one-time password and no longer make them uh, legit. So let's create and return the retention map. We will soon add the um, actual retention. So let's go ahead, retention map. We can do new OTP. A new OTP will return a one-time password. So let's go ahead and this solution will be using uh, uh, Google's UUID. Uh, it's a package which makes it fairly simple to um, create unique strings. Uh, in a real life solution, I would probably strengthen this a lot. Uh, I'm just making a very quick solution right now to show you how the ticketing system will work. So we, we create a function that allows the retention map to create new one-time passwords and the created will be time.map. And we will add this to the retention map. So let's go ahead and do retention map. One, let's use the key and let's place it uh, as value and let's also return it. Now, we also need a function which will verify that a one-time password is actually valid. So let's call it verify OTP. It will accept a string and return a bool. So if this key exists, we will return true. So let's check the retention map for the one-time password. And if it doesn't exist, we will return false. So OTP is not valid. And we will remove the one-time password and return true if somebody uses it. So verify one-time password will accept one a key, check if it exists, if it doesn't exist, it will return false. If it does exist, it will delete it. It's a one-time password, so we should delete it if it has been used. And then we will return true. So we can create new passwords and we can verify them and delete them. Uh, let's also go ahead and start the retention. So retention is a function with a context as input, the retention period as the second parameter, and we will create a ticker, so time.newTicker, and the ticker will be, let's say, each 400 milliseconds. This is how often we're going to be rechecking all the one-time passwords that are out there. So this will be running as a go routine, and each time the ticker ticks, we're going to loop through all the one-time passwords, and we're going to be using the timestamp stamp 
when it was created, we're going to add the retention period to know the time when the one-time password is no longer valid. And we're going to see if that time is before time.now. So the expiracy date is before our current time. This means that the password is no longer valid. So let's remove it. Let's also listen to the context done and return to cancel this function whenever the context gets closed. So let's go back up here. Whenever somebody creates a retention map, let's just go ahead and create the background process that runs. So go remove retention will start a go routine which runs in the background which continuously checks for expired one-time passwords. So we have a solution to create one-time passwords and delete them whenever they're old. Now that's great. Now the next part we need to do is we need to jump to the manager and the manager should have one of these retention maps. So let's go ahead and add that. Uh, let's call it OTPs and it's going to be a retention map. And in the factory, new manager function. Let's go ahead and simply create a new retention map. We're going to add the context uh, and we're going to say five seconds is the retention period. Now we don't have a context in the manager, so let's go ahead and add that since we will need that for now. So I'm adding a context to the manager also. Uh, the next thing we need to do is we need to make a new login endpoint. We have, we have no slash login endpoint right now. So we're going to create a super simple handler which uh, the manager will have. Uh, let's do it here under the serve WebSocket. So it's going to be a function for the manager, which is, let's call it login handler. And it's a HTTP handler. So we need to have a response writer and we need to have a pointer to a request. And we're going to accept the username and password from a member as JSON. So let's create an inline type called user login request destruct. It will contain the username and it will be username in JSON. It will contain the password. So that's how the request will look. So let's go ahead and initialize a new object and let's decode the JSON data that is coming inside the request body and we want to decode it. Sorry, that's supposed to be new decoder. Let's create a new JSON decoder. Let's pass in the request body. Let's recode it into, decode it into our request. So let's go ahead and check if error is not nil. Then we're going to return an HTTP error. Uh, something went wrong. Maybe they have a misformed request bad request. So let's return that to the user. Let's be nice. All right, we, we're accepting the JSON data, we're decoding it, and we're returning an error if anything's wrong. Now, we need to somehow tell the user that they are logged in, or we need to actually log in the user. The solution I'm going to be implementing is quick, because we're learning how to do this, not how to implement an authorization. To do that, you can check another guide uh, that is far too big of a scope to uh, do in this tutorial. I'm going to do a hard-coded login. Whenever the username is Percy, whenever the password is 123, we will accept them. You should replace this with your real authentication mechanism. So let's hard-code that. And let's say whenever we're logged in, we're going to respond. And the response is going to contain the one-time password. And it's going to contain it in the JSON field OTP, because that's what we said inside the here in the JavaScript we're expecting OTP. So let's go ahead and return that. To the user, we also need to, of course, from the manager, go into the retention map and then do new one-time password. And let's create a new response. 
and let's say that the one time password is the one time password dot key. So we're only returning the key. Let's marshal this and let's see if there's any errors when we marshal. Let's speed this up a bit. So I'm just gonna log whenever we have a JSON marshal. So let's write a header. We're going to write a status okay to the user and we're going to write the data and return. And if we get here, if it's if the password and username doesn't match our amazing secure password, we're going to return status unauthorized. So this is our login handler. It's fairly simple. We accept the request, we decode it, we check if it's these hard coded values. Bad. And then if the user is logged in, we create a new one time password or a ticket, so called, uh, if you wish and we return that to the user. Now, I hope that's fairly understandable. And one last thing we need to do is we need to go into main. We need to create a... Um, so one more thing we need to do, since we're sending the one-time password to the user and they are sending it back whenever we are serving the WebSocket, we need to actually check if the uh, one-time password is valid. And we want to do that before we connect them. So at the top of the serve WebSocket, let's go ahead and grab it, the ticket from the OTP get parameter. So if OTP is empty, let's go ahead and tell them that they are, again, unauthorized. Then we have a verify method, remember? So let's go ahead and if OTPs Verify OTP, let's pass in the one-time password. And if this returns false, let's just simply go ahead, return unauthorized, and that's it. If they get here, they have a valid ticket and we will allow them to connect. So one last thing that we need to do is we need to go into the main function. We made the manager accept a context. So we need to actually create a context and let's pass that context in to the manager. We also need to set up the login endpoints. So HTTP handle func slash login and it will execute the login handler. Once that's done, we're all set. We now have a authentication system in place. Now, I know we are using hard-coded passwords, which is bad. You should replace that with your own authentication uh, logic. So let's go ahead. Let's start up. We can see that the WebSocket is connected false. Let's go ahead and paste Percy Balmer123, and let's log in. We can see here that we received a one-time password. We received the one-time password and a 200 from the login. However, something is wrong here. We didn't add the WebSock, uh, the one-time password, which means we weren't allowed to connect. So let's go ahead and check the JavaScript where we go wrong. Let's go into the JavaScript, the login function to see where we're wrong and we're passing the data inside. Ah, right. I'm using a comma here, it should be plus. So go ahead and change the comma to plus because we want to append the OTP to the string. Let's visit the website again and go to the network tab. Let's clear it. Let's log in and let's see what happens. So we are now connected to the WebSocket. Perfect. I hope that makes sense. It's pretty easy. It's a pretty easy scheme. You know, you authenticate over regular HTTP, you get back a one time password, which is used as a, some sort of authentication ticket or token or whatever. Uh, another solution you can do is that you can have each message or each event sent with a JWT token or whatever. But I try to avoid that because it becomes pretty messy that each event should contain that. Um, you could probably make this wrapper event which has it, but again, you need to send the token over and over again, this prevents us from having to do that. And it also prevents bots from connecting and just consuming resources.
So we've added a bunch of security stuff. Uh, we have authentication, cross domain. We have uh, jumbo frames fixed. There's one thing that's left. We are using unencrypted data. Uh, in WebSockets, you can define which protocol to use. And we're using the WS protocol, which stands for WebSockets. It's the equivalent of HTTP. Now, in production, you will want to use WSS, which stands for WebSocket Secure. And it's the same thing, but WebSockets over HTTPS. That means our traffic will be encrypted. It's very simple to set up, so you should really do it. So let's go ahead. Let's close the program. The third, first thing we need to do is we need to change the protocol which is used, which we define in the beginning of the URL. It should be WSS instead. So that's WebSockets Secure. That's all you need to change in the front end. Now, in the back end, we need to host the server as HTTPS. And this will require us to have certificates. And I'm going to show you really quickly how you can fix it. If you don't have a certificate, you can create a self-signed certificate using uh, OpenSSL. And you can find OpenSSL ins installation instructions on their GitHub. Uh, there's going to be a link in the description. I won't show you how to install it. It's fairly easy, it's like takes a minute or two. Now, we're going to create certificates using OpenSSL. So to do that, I like to, I have this bash script actually that I always keep handy. Uh, so I'm going to do some bashing. Um, you can do this in, right in the terminal. I just do it here to, so I don't have to redo it. I'm not going to explain everything. This is really advanced stuff. Uh, just bear with me. Um, so we're going to create, create a server key, which we can use. And we're going to use OpenSSL gen RSO to create a RSA. And we're going to output it as a server key. We're going to use 2048 bits. Let's do, let's do gen key. And we're going to name, we're going to use the spec P algorithm 38. I'm going to check at my sheet sheet here. So I'm going to output it at the server key. So we've generated that. Yeah. Now we also need a server certificate. So server.cert. Let's do OpenSSL new. So there's multiple ways you can create self-signed certificates. Uh, you, uh, I'm using Linux, so this is the easiest way for me. You can probably look up how to create certificates using, using OpenSSL for your operating system if there's any differences. So the bash script is uh, only these three lines actually. And whenever you execute this, it will create two files. It will create the server key and we have a typo. Let me see, OpenSSL rec hesha256 out all ah, right days should have an I missed that sign so once that's done you should have two files server cert and server key um, now these files we can use to encrypt the traffic also remember to add those files if you're using certificates in your code uh, fetch the certificates from someplace safe. Don't push them to GitHub. There are bots out there that will scrape your repository really fast and steal your keys. Git ignore them. Don't store them in the repository, uh, whatever. Just keep them safe. Um, right. Once that's said and done, let's go to the main function. And we're using HTTP, listen and serve. We're going to change this. We're going to change this to HTTPS. And that's done by using listen and serve TLS instead. So listen and serve is regular HTTP. Listen and serve TLS accepts the same parameters, 
but also a certificate file and a key file. And you've guessed right, it's the two files that we created. So let's go ahead and add that. We're going to say server cert, and we're also adding the server key and then nil. So that's all you need to change. No, actually, that's not everything. Let's go into the manager and let's search for origin checker. Our origin will no longer be HTTP localhost. It will be HTTPS because we're now using HTTPS. Right. So that's all you need to change to make this work using HTTPS. Right. So again, we can go ahead and we can go run this. It will set up the HTTPS API instead. We can go to the front end again, which we have changed to use WebSocket Secure instead. All right. So also I'm going to HTTPS localhost. Your connection is not private. You will see this error message in your browser. And this is because you're using a self-signed certificate. If you're using a real certificate, which the browser recognizes, you should be fine. However, I know that I'm using a unsafe certificate right now. So we can click advanced and proceed to localhost. And here I am back inside this. So let's go ahead and try to connect again. And we will see that we're using uh, the WebSocket Secure instead and everything is working as expected. Let's type something, let's send a message. Let's see that it's sent. Uh, so great, we have a working solution that's um, doing um, everything that we did before, but we're now having a secure encrypted traffic, which is really important. Um, now, you might also see this error here, handshake error. And this is a remote error. This means that it's printed from the client. This is telling you that the browser does not recognize the certificate, but it's not an error in that way. If you used a real certificate, you wouldn't get that. So just ignore those messages for now. And congratulations, you're using encrypted WebSocket traffic instead of unencrypted. So we have covered how to connect WebSocket, how to send messages properly, how to heartbeat, how to apply a bunch of security. Now, there really isn't much left. With what we've learned today, you should be able to build a production-ready full-blown API. But before we conclude this tutorial, I want to make us implement the actual event handlers so that we can make the chat properly work. I won't be covering anything more architecturally uh, specific about WebSockets. I think what we have here is very sufficient to have a production ready system. We will only get some hands on experience by finalizing the handlers. It won't be too much. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, dive right in. Let's update the events that we can send. So let's begin inside the manager and let's go to set up event handlers where we currently only accept the send message. And send message simply prints the message to the console. Let's fix that. Uh, there's a nicer way to structure the code uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and do this simple for us. So whenever we receive a new message, we want a structure for that. We can actually place the new message event inside of the event. So new message event, and it will contain the send message event or inherit that, but it will also contain the time the message was sent. So it will contain message from and also the time the message was sent. Inside send message, let's go ahead and create an instance of the, that. So we have a chat event, which is send message event, and we will marshal the event payload into that chat event, because that's what we're receiving, right? A chat event. And we will check if the error is not nil. And if it is, we will return a wrapped error saying bad payload. 
in the request and we will do that. Now, whenever we send a message, we want this message to be sent to all other clients. So let's go ahead and create a broadcast message, which is in the format of new message. And broad message will have the send timestamp to the current time. And the message field will be the message from the chat event. And the from will be the same from as the chat event from. So let's go ahead and marshal this data. We will, after we have marshaled it, we will send it out to the other client. So let's check if the error isn't nil. And let's return a wrapped error saying fail to marshal the broadcast. So we have our broadcast message as a payload and let's create the outgoing event. And we can do this, outgoing event equals event. And the payload will be our data. And the type will be our event new message type. Oh, new message. Oh, event new message. It seems we don't have that yet. So let's go inside event, event new message. So what's going to be like? new underscore message. So we create a new event type and we say that the outgoing event is of this type to differ between the send event and the new event. Uh, send messages and the new messages. So send messages is when the user sends the message. New message is when they receive. You could probably use send and receive to make it up a little bit easy here. So this broadcast message or outgoing event should be used and we will simply iterate all the clients connected to the manager and we will do the client egress and send the outgoing event. So the send message handler is really simple. We receive a send message event from the user. They type in their UI, send this message, click the submit button, it gets here. We marshal it, we append data to it, we append the timestamp that they sent the message. We marshal it, and then we send this new data out to all other clients. So that's all we have to do on the back end. To implement the front end, we will change a few things. And we already have the event class here. I'm going to add two new classes. So they're going to be the same as inside the back end. So send message event and we're going to add a constructor and we're going to accept the message and from because that's the field that we expect in the backend. So let's just assign them whenever they we create a new send message event. And then let's go ahead and do the same thing for new message event. And they are also going to be the same as in the backend. So let's again go ahead and do the assigning. So we have two classes that corresponds between the backend and the frontend. Now the send message function here, we're going to update it to send the proper format. And uh, to do that, we're going to go in here and say, let outgoing event, new send message event. And we're going to pass in the data. So new message dot value. We're going to send from who it is and let's hard code this to Percy because we have no form field where we allow them to set their username. So let's go ahead and just do that. We create a new send message event with the value of the message and a hard coded value of the username. And then we send that event to the WebSocket. Um, so what will happen now is we will send the send message event that will be accepted by clients and pushed out to all the other clients and even yourself because we broadcast it to all clients. Um, it will return a new message event, which we are supposed to render. So let's go up to route event. And you can see I prepared the new message here, but we're not going to print new message simply. We're going to do a message event and we're going to object assign new message 
new message event and we're going to assign the data payload and let's see after we have the message event so this will take the payload create a new message event from it and we want to add that to the chat message so let's go let's create a new function which is called append chat message which accepts a parameter which is the event uh, so let's create a new date from the message event dot sent so the payload that comes in will have the sent uh, field with the date that the message was sent so let's create a date from that and let's format the message uh, let's format this very easily let's do date to locate date string now let's do locale string and let's have the message after. So we will print the date and then the message. And let's append this to the text area. So let's fetch the text area. Document get element by ID. And it's called chat, I think. Chat messages, that's correct. So let's get this chat messages and let's go ahead and do a simple inner HTML text area is inner HTML plus let's add a new line for each message and then the formatted message. Let's also scroll the text area because we want it to follow along the messages that are sent. So scroll top equals text area scroll height this will kind of keep it scrolling so we are sending messages we're broadcasting those messages and we're printing the messages to the text area let's go ahead and try this let's start up the back end and let's open up the front end and let's go ahead and open two tabs so let's log both of them in we're connected and this one is not connected but let's connect it so we have two tabs which are connected let's go ahead and do place them next to each other like this uh, so we have two connected clients and let's go ahead and type hello in one of them and send it and we actually have an error Error handling message, bad payload in request. Cannot unmarshal string into go value. So we cannot unmarshal the string into a go value. And if we go into the send message, uh, we can see I forgot to update uh, the send message event. We're sending the string value. We're not sending the outgoing event. So let's update that. And let's connect both clients again. So let's Go ahead, let's kind of refresh both. I'm going to connect both of them and they are both connected. So let's send hello and we didn't see the message. All right, so we need to also call append chat message and let's append the chat message event. So once we've done that, we should now see each new message being sent. Let's go ahead and update that. Let's open both our tabs and let's refresh them and let's go ahead and log in let's go ahead and log in both of them are logged in let's send hello and you will see our own message but the other clients will also see the hello message so perfect we can now send messages between each and every client that was easy so we have this amazing chat where we can send messages to each other um, and if we want even more practice, we could implement the whole chat room stuff. Uh, right now we're using one chat room, but you could easily update this by adding a new uh, um, new event and a new event handler. Uh, let's take a minute and do that just to show you how easy it is to add new features. So we create a new event called change chat room, and we're going to create the constructor which will receive the name of the chat room and let's go ahead right here do function change chat room and 
we're going to get the chat room currently selected. Get chat room, and if new chat isn't null, or if the value isn't equal to the currently selected chat, because we don't want them to spam change to the same chat room. You can only change to a new chat room. So let's assign the currently selected chat room to the new chat room. And let's create a header and document get element by ID. So we call it the chat header. And we're going to change to currently in, and then just like, let's apply chat room. Let's just apply the selected chat just to show the users which chat room they are currently in. Now let's send a message to the WebSocket that we are changing the chat room. And let's create the event. Let's create the event by inserting the selected chat. And let's just send the event. Let's call the, chain, the event change room. And we're going to send the change event, which we create there, send it, and Let's also clean the text area. Let's go ahead and copy the text area, uh, text area selection, and let's just make it empty. Inner, or let's do, let's do a formatted you changed room into, just to show the users what they're doing. You changed into the selected chat room. So that's everything from the front. And oh, we also, whenever they go uh, whenever they submit in the here, we can see chat room selection. We use the change chat room function. So in here, we also need to um, change the chat room. So let's grab the change chat room function. Oh, we're doing, this is my bad. Let's simply, we have two functions, so my bad. Let's remove this and only have the this function the new function, then updated. I created a new function instead of updating the old one, sorry. So we have a change chat room in place, which will trigger a event. So let's go inside the backend manager and let's go to setup event handlers where we can add new events. And we're going to add a event called event change room. And let's do chat room handler as the function. Let's go inside the event we're going to create a new event called chat room and we're going to use the same string value as we set in the javascript which was change room let's save and let's update the clients as well the client will have a field called chat room which will be used by the client to kind of know which chat room they currently in on the back side and back end side of things also. Um, so inside the event again, we have added the change room and let's go ahead and add a handler for this. So let's go ahead and add a change room event and the event we created in the front end simply passed in the string name so let's just accept that. Uh, and let's go into the manager and let's go ahead and do, so let's go inside the manager and let's create the actual chat room handler function. And it has to be a handler signature. So we're going to accept the event and the client who sent the message. So let's go ahead and save and let's see event change room does not exist. What did I name it? Change room. Perfect. So uh, the handler will be really simple. Let's accept the um, change room event and let's unmarshal the payload, which will contain the name of the new uh, chat room that we're going to be inside. And uh, let's see if there's any errors. Uh, bad payload in request. So once we receive the change chat room event, we will take the client, because we accept the client here, we will simply take that client and change the chat room that is assigned 
to the event name and we will return nil. So this is a super simple handler which will change the chat room that the client is currently in. Now we also need to go down to send message and where, when we loop over the client, we can simply add a if client chat room equals um, the current client chat room. So somebody sends a message. We will only send that message to the same chat room that the current client is in. So we can see that if each client who is in the same chat room as the current client, we want to send a message to their egress. Now, whenever we're in different chat rooms, we won't get the same message. Perfect. Uh, let's restart the backend. This should be everything, I think. So let's open up our um, two separate frontends again. Let's reconnect them and let's log in. Once they are both logged in, we are logged in. We're both in general. So let's do one, two, three. Both of them receive it. But let's go ahead and change to the private chat room. And something failed. Let's go ahead and change to the Let's log in and let's see what's going on. Change chat room and make this bigger. So it's actually sending a regular HTTP request. So something is wrong. Oh, sorry. We forgot to return false. Always return false. If we don't return false, it will redirect since it's a form. Apart from returning false, we also need to re uh, change that to assign name into name, not name into this. So let's go ahead and restart the application, bring up the front ends again, and let me make this smaller and let's update both of them. And let's log in. That is logged in. That one is logged in. Let's send a message. And we can see both of them received the message. But let's change this user into a private chat room. So we've changed into a private chat room. And let's send hello again. And we're the only ones to receive it now. This one is in another chat room, so it doesn't receive it. Perfect. Now, this concludes the tutorial. We have built a whole framework for how to use WebSockets uh, in a server with GoBang. And we have a server that's secure, scalable, and easily to manage, uh, according to me. So we have covered the following aspects of WebSockets in this tutorial. We have learned how to connect the WebSockets, how to efficiently read and write messages to WebSockets in Go, how to structure a Go backend API with WebSockets using the event-based design pattern, uh, you can clean up the current structure in the current code a lot. Uh, it's all in the same package, for instance. We could separate that. Uh, that's basically up to you. Uh, we have learned how to connect, keep connections alive in WebSockets by using ping pong and hard beating. We have learned how to avoid users from exploiting the WebSocket by limiting message size and also how to only limit the origins they come from, how to authenticate using an OTP system. You should be able to replace that authentication with whatever solution you want. Uh, how to also encrypt the traffic and use HTTPS and uh, WSS instead of regular websites. So I hope this tutorial has helped you understand Ali at least a little bit more about WebSockets in Go. And you should be e you should easily be able to port this and create clients for whatever language you want. Um, is, if you want to use another Go client instead of a JavaScript client, for instance, you can use the same ideas and methods that we have learned. So if you have any ideas, uh, feedback, or uh, stuff you want to know more about, uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, uh, either in the comments here at YouTube or in the contact me page on my website. Um, and I really hope you enjoyed this article. I know I enjoyed creating it. So give a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe to my channel if you want to see more of me.